using a HELOC to purchase your next investment property. That's today's show. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris, longtime real estate investor, and welcome, Freedom Fighters, to the Investing in Real Estate show. Thank you so much for finding the show. If you're new to the channel or if you're a longtime listener, you know the drill. This is the show where we focus on helping you build passive income, cash flow. And we do it on all sorts of markets across the country, from Michigan down to Ohio to Indiana to Pennsylvania to New Jersey. It doesn't matter where your investment properties are as long as you're buying performing assets assets that are cash flowing every month. That's how you build true financial freedom. So one of the ways that I've purchased real estate over the years, in fact, I think it's my number one way that I've bought properties over the years, is using a HELOC. It's a home equity line of credit. It's a line of credit that lets you purchase properties based on the equity in your own primary residence. Now, there's a difference between a HELOC and a home equity loan. So let's talk about the differences here. And, you know, again, I come back to this idea that I love buying and using a HELOC because it's a repetitive line of credit. And that's what a line of credit is. You go to the bank, they look at the value of the home you live in, and they give you a line. A loan is a separate thing. They're basically giving you a check. They're basically giving you a check. And if they say that the value of that home is worth $80,000, they give you a check for $80,000. And the clock starts on that interest. So now you're paying on that interest like immediately. And guess what? It's not rinse and repeatable, meaning they're just going to cut you a check as a loan and you don't get to go back to the till over and over and over and over again. Now that's the difference between a loan and a home equity line of credit. The line, you start with a zero balance. You start with a zero balance like a credit card and you can fill it up, right? Pay it back down, fill it up again, and it lasts for about 10 years. Most banks will give you a line of credit that lasts about 10 years. You can then go back to them after 10 years, renegotiate it, get a new line, or even during the life of that line of credit, you can go back to them and renegotiate. So what is it based on? Well, you know what I like to say about the home you live in, right? The home you live in is uh, a liability, right? It's not a performing asset, despite what people think. It is not a performing asset, right? The poor and the middle class think that owning a home that you live in is a performing asset. It's not. It is a liability. The other night we were having dinner and my five-year-old and my seven-year-old, uh, we were playing a game. I know you might, th you might think, well, this is a boring game. <laughs> but uh, instead of playing the superhero game that my kids want to play all the time, where we come up with different superhero stories, I said, we're going to play is it a performing asset or is it a liability? And I would throw out random objects, random things that could either be a performing asset or liability. For instance, a boat. You know, is that a performing asset or is that a liability? My kids would say, that's a liability. And I'd say, why is that a liability? And they'd have to answer and really think through. You know, a liability takes money from you and does not put money in your pocket. A performing asset monthly puts uh, cash flow in your pocket. You know, wealthy people look at their net worth. Their net worth is based on performing assets. So when I threw them out the question, what about this house that we live in? You know, we live in a large house. Is this a performing asset or is this a liability? And the answer took them a little while was it's a liability. And I said, great. Why is the house we live in a liability? And they thought about it and they realized that it costs us a lot of money to live in this house. That every month we're paying a mortgage, we're paying electric bills, we're paying heating bills, we're paying for fixes and repairs. It is a liability. And therefore it's not performing for us. No one is paying us to live in this house. But there is a way, and it's the HELOC strategy, there is a way to kind of transform and take that liability if you have a home that you live in and start to turn it into a vehicle to help you buy performing assets, okay? I'm not saying turn it into a performing asset. Like, I don't want you to rent out a room in your house. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm saying if you think about using this house as a way to help you start acquiring performing assets, then we can be on the same path. So for round numbers, let's just say the house is worth five, um, we, we bought it for $500,000 and we only owe $200,000 remaining on that house. Well, now I go to a local bank. I say to them, look, I'd like to get a home equity line of credit 
on my house. Great. They'll assess the property and they'll see that you have $300,000 of equity and they're going to give you about 80% of that 300,000, right? 80% loan to value. So they may give you or 75%. It depends on the bank. So they're going to give you 80%. Now, let's just say again for round numbers you have 200,000 to work with. Again, my math is off, but you follow me. I just want to say for the home equity line of credit, the amount that the bank is giving you is $200,000. They're saying the equity in your home, we're going to place a second mortgage on your home and here you go. Here's a line of credit. Now you start with a zero balance with your line of credit and you don't pay anything until you actually start running up that bill. That's different again than the loan because the loan you're getting a check. You're just getting a check for $200,000 and that interest rate starts immediately. And now you, you don't get to rinse and repeat. You don't get to go back to the drawing board and make that money over again. You've got to pay it off and you're done. So with a line of credit, you start with a zero balance. And remember, the reason I love this is because it's simple interest. It's different than amortized loans that you have as your primary mortgage, right? So your amortized loan, you're paying that interest up front. If you've ever gotten those coupons that you used to get when you bought your first plot, property. I remember the very first property I ever purchased, they gave me a binder and it had a whole thing of uh, coupons that I could rip out and send into the bank. And for the first seven years, they showed that amortization schedule. I was paying all interest for that first seven or eight years of the loan. That's different than a home equity line of credit because you're starting and you're paying it like a credit card every month and it doesn't accrue in the same way that amortized interest does and an amortized loan. So you're, you're using two different financial vehicles, two different financial products in order to make yourself wealthy and increase your net worth. Now, you may say to yourself, why would you want to use this strategy rather than cash? Well, look, using the equity in your home, you're leveraging. The bank is giving you money to use, right? They're giving you, you otherwise this house is a liability. So if the bank is going to give you money to use in order to purchase real estate, I would much rather use that right? Yes, you can pay it back and you want to make sure that your tenants are paying back the loan. So this is the beauty of this strategy. And again, I have acquired more rental properties using the HELOC than I have any other form of wealth building, any other financial product, private money, cash on hand. I've used my own HELOC in my own house to purchase properties more than anything else. Now, you want to make sure though that your leverage point is covered by your cash flow. So what do I mean? Well, I'm not a big fan. I would not recommend taking your HELOC and going out and doing a flip, right? Finding a house in your backyard and spending nine months rehabbing a house in order that you cross your fingers and hope that you can flip it to somebody, right? Uh, you know, a young, a young family that wants to move into it eight months after you've uh, renovated it. That I would not recommend. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of the flipping strategy. I'm a fan of buy and hold. I want to hold forever, right? So when you buy, I want this, you know, I want your tenant and the cash flow to make sure that you're more than covering the amount you're paying back on your HELOC. So again, if you get a HELOC for 3.99% uh, 3 interest, right? Or, you know, again, round numbers, nearly 4% interest, but you're cash flowing, like all the properties I buy are between like 9 and 12% cash flow. So that's a nice spread, right? That's a nice spread where I've got enough wiggle room that I can cover my taxes, expenses, and property management fees, and I still have cash coming in every month, enough that my tenant is paying this loan for me. Does that make sense? My tenant is paying my HELOC back, not me. The tenant, the cash flow from that property is what's covering my, is what's covering my expenses on this property. That's the beauty of this strategy, and then every month, I'm increasing my equity again into this property. And then I can go back to the local bank and I can say, look, I now have these additional assets. Um, I've increased the equity even in my own home because you're still paying your main mortgage, don't forget, right? You're increasing the equity in your own home, but you're still paying the primary mortgage. Now I can increase that home equity loan. So we just did that on our home, in fact. We had a lot of equity to work with and we just kind of got lazy about it. And I said to my wife recently, I said, hey, let's call up our bank and let's reposition our, our home equity line of credit because we had a couple hundred thousand to work with. Let's amp that puppy up. Let's max it out and then let's go on a buying spree. 
So my wife and I right now are using our home equity line of credit. We're buying properties in Ohio. We're buying properties in our Michigan market. We're doing all, you know, we're buying, we're just buying and we're using the bank to do it. I mean, it's a no brainer. So using the bank to add to my net worth. Now, how does this happen at closing? So you may be saying to yourself, okay, I have a home equity line of credit and uh, I want to, and I found an investment property that I want to buy. I'm going to buy this house for 50,000 or I'm going to buy this property for $60,000. Um, it's going to cash flow, you know, $800 a month. Um, how do I close on it? Well, it's just the same as if you're paying cash for it. You literally have a home equity line with a check. You would transfer that money, wire that money to the title company on closing day. And because there's no mortgage involved, meaning you're not taking out a mortgage on the investment property, you are writing a check from a mortgage you already have in place. You already have the home equity line of credit in place, so you're just writing a check. You're transferring the money from your bank to the title company at closing, and guess what? Now you own this investment property free and clear. Now, yes, your home equity line of credit has gone up to 50000 now, right? It's increased up to 50000 or whatever purchase price on the property, 60000 Now the rent starts paying it back, you know, over and over and over again. Before you know it, that house is paid off in three years. So the bank enabled you to build wealth on the backs of their own money. Yes, based on the equity in your home. But it's a killer strategy, and that's why I love it. And so really, you get to have that, that credit card, you get to have those, that checkbook from your home equity line of credit, rinse and repeat, and keep buying rental properties with that money. In another video series, we're gonna talk about the way in which the tax code and has changed now because of the 2018 tax law. We're gonna talk about the differences there because there are some significant changes. So we'll dive into some of the nitty gritty on the taxes around this type of mortgage because it has changed. It has shifted. In fact, uh, Natalie and I wrote a book on how to pay off your primary mortgage using a HELOC. And most of the mechanics are still true, but we need to certainly um, update and revise the edition to talk about the changes in the tax code. So that will be another, uh, that will be another episode we will bring to you really soon here on the channel. In the meantime, if you are ready to pick up your first rental property or your 10th rental property, that's what we do all day long at my company. So you can come over to our website, just go to morrisinvest.com, click on the schedule a consultation button, and you pick the time that works for you. We'll jump on the phone for 30 minutes with our team. We'll find out you know, how many rental properties do you currently have? How many are you looking to acquire? What has your overall strategy been over the past few years? And we'll help you get towards financial freedom. That's what we do all day long. And our properties are you know, turnkey, so it's pretty, it's pretty easy. <laughs> it's very, very easy to work with. Um, so please dial us up. I cannot wait to talk with you and our team is standing by. But in the meantime, I want you to go out there take action, become a real estate investor, use all of the strategies that we talk about here on the show. But you know, like I said, the HELOC strategy is one of my all-time favorites. We'll see you next time, everyone.